just a recording. Oh, I was going to say, boy, I need grass. <laughs> I, I thought, I don't know if I have the bandwidth to, yeah. to pull it off. Welcome, everybody. We're going to get started. Welcome to the Star of Bethlehem 2016 Church Picnic. Thank you all for coming. Uh, we begin a new stewardship program today, Stewards of the King. And uh, the theme today is Serving God or Helping Yourself. The topic is kind of, a, kind of an interesting one. It's one of the least known parables um, in Scripture, and that is of the unjust steward. And as to what we are to do with our possessions and how this bad example can be a good one for us. We worship our God with our first hymn, hymn 477, What is the World to Me? All of the hymns are printed for you in your worship folder.
for the chances he gives us to build up the kingdom. Let us lift up our hearts to the Lord in prayer. May our offerings reveal our gratitude to you, O Lord. For the ways Christ's light has shown through his people, let us lift up our hearts to the Lord in prayer. May our lives be filled with peaceful pursuits and honest ambitions, O Lord. Christ is our master for all time, and he continues to open our eyes to the treasures of his grace. Enrich our, our lives in you, O Lord, now and forever. Amen. Turn to me and be saved, says the Lord, for I am God and there is no other. If we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Today we consider how we are to use the worldly resources God provides us for the good of all people. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have focused more on prophets than on people, and we have complained about our politicians without praying for them. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Though we misuse his gifts, yet our Heavenly Father provides us income, intelligence, and each other to meet our daily needs. In his mercy, he has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, God gives the power to become children of God, and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, we praise our God with this song printed in your worship folder. Yeah. Is there any left? Yeah. yeah. 
little bit. All right, last couple. All right, Addison, come here. Leah, come here. Come on down, have a seat. Have a seat. Have a seat. You can sit on that. All right, good job. Uh, last one, Zane. Go to you. Great job, guys. All right. Now, that was a pretty simple job. Here, you can have a seat right here, guys. Yep. Good job. Jump up there. You're too hot. <laughs> there you go, how's that? Is that good? Alright, now, that was a pretty easy job, right? Yeah, yeah. Which do you think was the worst tool to do, to, to do that job? Spoon. Why do you think this one was going to be bad? You didn't know what you tried it. Yeah. Well, it's that one. Holds it. So if you put this in the water and tried to scoop it up, what would happen, Zane? Do you know? Would it work? No. no, the water would just go through the holes, right? Yeah. But How, if, yeah. What? But, but if it's just a regular spoon without holes in it, it would just scoop it up. Yeah. Would it do a good job? Yeah. Would it do as good a job as Addison's pitcher? No. no, that was the best one, wasn't it, right? Those cups worked, right? You just yeah. couldn't get as much, maybe? Yeah. Well, what I want to talk to you about is as you go through life, God <laughs> gives you gifts. And God gives you jobs to do. And sometimes there's different gifts that you have to do, and sometimes you can go about them differently, maybe better. Would it be better to do your homework with the TV on while you're trying to watch it? No. Um, yeah, there's different things in life just like that, where you should probably try to follow the rules, maybe think about what's the best way I can do this. How can I best use my time to serve my God? I want to have fun. Yeah, I know that I have responsibilities, jobs to help around the house. Should I have fun first or maybe ask my parents how I can help them first? Yeah, that's really the better option, to how to help them first. They want you to have fun. They love you. But they also want you to maybe take time and think, how, how can I be helpful? That's, it go, carries on from your little kids all the way up to when you become big kids. What's the best use of my time? And you don't have any money yet. You don't have any cash flow. But as God gives you money too, what's the best use of my money too? Let's fold our hands and pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you for giving us all of your blessings. Help us to use them wisely and to make good use of our time, our talents, and our treasures. Amen. Amen. You're excused to go back and sit with your parents.
The Lord does not condemn those who follow wise business practices to honestly make the most of their situation. Rather, he condemns dishonesty in business dealings, specifically as a sign of self-serving, luxury-loving attitude that rules the heart of the greedy. The Lord will not forget what they have done. He will bring them into justice on the day of judgment. Hear this, you who trample the needy and do away with the poor of the land, saying, When will the new moon be over, that we may sell grain, and the Sabbath ended, that we may market wheat? Skimping the measure, boosting the price, and cheating with dishonest scales, buying the poor with silver, and the needy for a pair of sandals, selling even the sweepings with the wheat. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, I will never forget anything they have done. Our second lesson is taken from 1 Timothy chapter 2, the first eight verses. Focus shifts from payment received to payment made. It is Jesus who used his own blood to buy back and set free all of humankind from the shackles of sin. One might describe this redemptive work as making the best use of available resources. The proclamation of this best business practice is the reason we exist. Therefore, we pray for peace in our world, not for booming economies. This prayer begs that nothing would hinder us from proclaiming the gospel of eternal peace through Jesus. I urge that, first of all, that requests, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings, and for all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all men, a testimony given in its proper time. And for this purpose, I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying, and a teacher of the true faith to the Gentiles. I want men everywhere to lift up holy hands in prayer without anger or disputing. This is the word of our Lord. We bow our heads in prayer. Lord God, you call us to work in your kingdom and leave no one standing idle. Help us to order our lives by your wisdom and to serve you in willing obedience. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue with our hymn of the day. Brothers, sisters, let us clap.
stand for the words of our King. Our Gospel this morning is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, the first 13 verses. Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of his man master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 800 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager quickly told him, take your bill, sit down, quickly make it 400. And he asked the second, and how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves, so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will devote, be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Be deceived. Dear Christian friends, this is a troubling parable, and it was for the vast majority of my life because I didn't get it. How is someone who is dishonest, an open thief? I mean, we, we rip on dishonest businessmen all the time, and here you have one of the pages of Scripture, a parable told by our Lord and Savior, who is upheld, sort of, as an example. What are we to do with this? And how does this work in the kingdom? Do I, how is it good that he lost his job? There's just so many things that I don't get. We're going to explore all of this today as we begin our next sermon series, Stewards of the King. Today you'll see how you can be a shrewd steward. Well, what are you to do with all of this information? You go through the first part of the parable and the guy is bad. He's dishonest. He gets caught and he's about to lose his job. Now what? Verse 4, I know what I'll do, so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their home. Well, he's not moral, he's not honest, but he is shrewd. Now what is that? We don't use the word shrewd a whole lot. Is that a term of endearment, or is that, is that of a bad connotation? If somebody called you shrewd, should you say thank you? What do you do with that? Well, if you go into Merriam-Webster's dictionary, the first definition is someone who is shrewd is marked by clever discerning, awareness, and hard-headed acumen. So if I told one of my children, you have shrewd common sense, that's a compliment. And the second one is given to wily and artful ways or dealings. This person is a shrewd operator. It's actually a compliment. It means you're clever. You're doing something right. Maybe it doesn't even look right, but you figured it out. Maybe somebody just handed you the pitcher, and you were lucky. Maybe somebody handed you the spoon, and you were smart enough to say, I'm not using that. There's no way you're going to get me to get water going in a slotted spoon. Well, this man sees the problems, and he acts. He jumps right on it. In verse 5, he called in each one of his master's debtors. They were in debt to his master, but after he changed their bills and their debts, now they were in debt to him. Because he thought, when I lose my job, 
I know that someone's going to look out for me, and I know that these guys will be thankful for what I have done for them. All right? Verse 8, the master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. It's not like he came in and said, boy, great job. Thank you. It was when a batter strikes out and he walks away saying, that pitcher got me. That curveball, I had no prayer. On the soccer pitch, I suppose that's more common nowadays. He got around me. The ball went right through my legs. I was May. That was how he was commended. Just, oh, that was a good one. You're fine. Not good job. Well, verse 9, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into earthly dwellings. This is one of the most confusing verses to me. And the thought is actually pretty simple. Most people in business are thinking about, what, the next 50 years? They're working toward a retirement, maybe? Christian, what are you working toward? Heaven. You're working toward an eternity. The Bible says you work out your, your salvation with trembling and fear. What, is, what does that mean? Well, you know that sin is dangerous. You know that your God is gracious and merciful. You know that you're forgiven for everything. When you heard that first lesson from Amos, and you heard God say, I will never forget anything they have done, you are thankful that that is true, because in Jesus, you never have to wonder if God got all of your sins taken care of. Every one of your sins was remembered when Jesus died on the cross. So on the last day, as you stand before God, you are not guilty. Because God only sees Jesus' perfection in you, not the sin and the guilt that you've earned. Only the eternity that Jesus earned for you. Well, that's pretty impressive, isn't it? I have to look at verse 9 a little bit closer for you. I tell you, use worldly wealth. Worldly wealth in the Greek is the mammon of unrighteousness. Now, the NIV translation is not bad. I think if anyone ever uses the expression worldly wealth, you're thinking, well, that's probably bad. Or a necessary evil. It actually has a worse connotation in the original. Mammon of unrighteousness. It's translated filthy lucre sometimes, too, if that means more to you growing up. It was not a pretty picture. And this also talks about, uh, in 1 Timothy, the same phrase, the love of money is the root of all evil. So, here's the problem. We live in a cash society. This is a monetary system. Is money evil? No, it's not. It's never evil. Money is a tool like anything else that you have. And Jesus goes on to explain as to what you're supposed to do with this. Listen to verses 10 through 12. Whoever can be trusted with very little can be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little can be, will be dishonest with much. You know that it's far more valuable to value your soul than it is your bank account. You know that the truth that Jesus loves you offers more riches than any lottery would. This is true. But he says, so if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches, spiritual wealth? And if you have not been trusted with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? This is where my mind stumbled for so many years. The problem I had with this was that the man was being dishonest or shrewd with his master's possessions. How many of you have your own money, your own job, your own career that you made for yourself? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> None of you do. <coughs> the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. This man wasn't using his own money. This became clear last year in Roanoke, Virginia. Uh, President uh, Wendland from the seminary came and did a whole series on parables. And he said, when I went to Africa, I was a missionary. And I came with God's word to the people. Do you know how they saw me? It wasn't as a missionary, it was as a rich man. He had a car. And he didn't click with them for six